in London in 1856, people were dying all over the place. They were dying in their homes, and they were literally dying in the streets. Physicians were completely overwhelmed chasing the symptoms without much success. One physician in particular, ironically named John Snow, perhaps, wanted to think about it a little differently and wondered why all of this was happening. At the end of the day, what he found was that everybody that was getting sick was drinking from a single water fountain in central London that today we know had the cholera bacteria in it. I think we're faced with a similar epidemic today, only it's about stress. Some stress is good for you and OK for you. Other stress, toxic stress, can kill you. It changes your metabolism, and it certainly changes how you feel about yourself. There's hard evidence to support this, too. Suicide rates are going up for the first time in decades. College-age students have been adjudged to have the same anxiety levels as psychiatric inpatients in the 1950s, and our life expectancy is going down. Social media isn't helping either. It's addictive. MRI studies show that the same areas of your brain light up when you take cocaine and when you hear that little ping from your phone. This is particularly problematic and true for young people who quite naturally compare themselves to their peer group. 20 years ago, that peer group was 20, 25 kids in a classroom and maybe a handful at home. Today, those same kids are comparing themselves to the whole world. And social media isn't helping in other ways, either. We think we're more connected. But in fact, there's emerging evidence that says we're feeling lonelier and more isolated. And importantly, loneliness and social isolation have the same risk of early death as obesity and cigarette smoking. So what do we do with all of these sort of bad feelings? Well, we develop compensatory behaviors to help us get through the day. And they work. And at the end of that day, the question becomes, are they good habits? Are they bad habits for us? And the answer is yes. They're good habits because they, in fact, work to help you get through the day. There's all kinds of evidence that eating carbohydrates releases endorphins in our bloodstream makes you feel better. And my guess is I'm not the only one in the room who's perhaps had a glass of beer at the end of a the day. They're bad habits because they can lead to chronic diseases. And the doctor will give you uh, some medicine for those symptoms and then maybe a second medicine for the uh, side effects and probably a pamphlet on healthy eating. So patients then are confronted with this paradox. Do I keep doing what I'm doing today because it helps me get through the day today or do I give those things up for, for some future state of well-being well down the road? Those same behaviors that are compensatory are also some of the main drivers of this explosion that we see in this country in chronic diseases. And mainstream medicine is now starting to call these diseases lifestyle diseases, meaning they're born of our choices rather than some underlying disease process. And it's not because I don't think we've all become couch potatoes or addicted to soap operas and sugary drinks. And healthcare reform efforts have had any number of efforts in the past few years to try and corral some of these behaviors and educate us. What's missing in all of those discussions is the why in our behavior, the why we're doing what we're doing. I think the reason that we're not talking about that is that because those are the noble efforts to help us get through the day, so we don't want to change them. Nowhere is this more true than in distressed communities where poverty, community violence, poor schools, and worrying about putting food on the, enough food on the table for your family are everyday, all-day burdens, and no small burden either. Medicine can't help solve all of society's ills, but working with behavioral health providers, it can begin to help people get through the day without ruining their health over the long term. And this isn't really just about people in distressed communities. It's about every single one of us, from the crummy commute every day to more serious things like the death of a loved one. There's a continuum of emotional distress, and we need to have responses that equal that continuum. Today, medicine waits until the extremes. Cancer care, almost uniformly now, has very sophisticated support groups in it. And antidepressant medication is almost a standard of care for post-cardiac event uh, individuals. What we've got to do is help people understand and appreciate the stress they're under, 
that leads to compensatory behaviors, that leads to poor health outcomes, and put medicine in a position to begin intervening earlier in that disease process. If we can start treating disease, yes, but healing the patient, we can make great strides and help millions of people lead healthier lives. If we don't, and if our bad habits don't kill us, the way we treat them will. Thank you very much.